Good morning, everyone. Jesse, your pastor of discipleship here, and we are in week two of Sunday School Online because of uh, having to be quarantined. So if you haven't yet, go ahead and grab your Bibles, something to write down on, and we will get started in three, two, one. Oh, hey, there you are. So today, just to mix things up a little bit, we are coming to you from the Pathfinders class. So if you belong to that class, here you are. Here's a little look at your home away from home. And uh, as we get into our lesson today, uh, last week we talked about Jesus being dedicated at the temple. And this week we're talking about this young man who was in this world but not of this world. He had great power and uh, he didn't use it to his own gain or anything like that. And uh, he came to save the world. And I think we all know who I'm talking about, right? Superman. <laughs> There are a lot of similarities between Superman and Jesus. In fact, there is this uh, picture that goes around the internet where it shows Jesus, and I'll put it up on the screen now, and it's all these other superheroes, and Jesus is telling them, here's how I saved the world. And I think that our world is always craving that kind of story where there is someone who comes in in the midst of everything going wrong and is able to save the people. So as we look at our lesson today, I hope you have your Bibles. Uh, we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and open them up to there. I'll put the passage up on the screen as we read, and so we can check it out now. And the child grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover, and when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended... As they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, sitting among the teachers, listening to them, and asking them questions. And all who heard were amazed at his understanding and his answers. Now, this is a very interesting passage. We only find this account in the Gospel of Luke, which I think is pretty interesting because he is the one that has taken this investigative look into the life of Jesus. And he's the one that's gone around and he's interviewing people and he's trying to figure out as much as he can. And this is one of the things that he comes across. Perhaps it's because he interviews Mary or one of Jesus' brothers and sisters. We're not really sure. We, don't, we aren't told. But we know that Luke has gone around and he's interviewed these people to figure out who this Jesus is. And so we get this amazing account. And what we learn from it is that there is this amazing amount of information about the humanity of Jesus. As a young boy, he had to grow. He didn't just show up on the spot as a grown man ready to accomplish this mission for God. No, he came as a baby, we saw him dedicated, and now he's a young man at the age of around 12 years old. And we see that as he's in the temple, we see a few things, that he's growing, he's growing up in, in his physical nature, he's maturing, so he's learning, and, and it's just this idea that he is not just God in the flesh, but he's bound by certain things in his flesh. So he is learning humility. Even though he may know a lot at this point, he is going to the temple and he is dialoguing with the rabbis and learning from them and asking them questions and digging into God's word, which is, of course, a great um, example set for us. Now, as Jesus is in this temple and his parents have left and they've gone away for a day, and then they realize he's not there, and then it took him a day to come back, and then it's probably taken him a day to search all over Jerusalem to find their son Jesus. Now, I try to think of this. I don't have kids myself, but for all of you who do, to try to imagine what it's like to lose your child. And this is in time we don't have cell phones, we don't have GPS tracking chips that we can put on our kids or anything like that. But not only is it the, the perhaps terror of, of losing your child, but also think about the fact that this is not just any child. This is the son of God, that both Mary and Joseph have been visited by angels of God to tell them how great their, their child would be and all the things that he's going to do. And to think that you just lost him, man, that is one of probably the biggest felt parenting fails that you could ever think of. So I think that's 
pretty interesting that it, we see this depiction of Mary and Joseph. It wasn't uh, neglectful or anything like that. They had assumed that he was with them, but it took them three days to find him after they realized that he wasn't with them. So what an uh, interesting uh, perspective to think of when we, when we talk about Mary and Joseph and their relationship to Jesus. But when they finally do find him, what we, what we see is that Jesus is in the temple. And I try to think of it like this in that people are probably coming in and out of the temple on a regular basis. But as this young man, Jesus, is talking with the religious leaders, it's the questions. It's the things that he gives as an answer when maybe he's questioned that is causing all these people to gather around almost like a street performer. And as everyone is gathering around, Mary and Joseph come on the scene. They're back in Jerusalem, and they find Jesus, and it says that they are amazed with who Jesus is, what he's doing, and, and what, you know, they, they could have been angry with him, which I think there is probably a little bit of frustration, a little bit of anxiousness, a little bit of terror involved with losing Jesus. But they find him, and it says that they're amazed with what's going on. So, a question that I want to ask you is this. Why do you think it's important for us to know that Jesus was both fully God and fully human? Take a minute. I'm going to put that question on the screen for you. And a couple of passages that you can look up if you need a little help. Well, I hope your discussions went well there and some of those passages were helpful for you to understand why it's important for us to understand why Jesus is both fully God and fully human. And if you read those passages, those will be really helpful for you. But we have to keep reading into this passage. We see in verses 48 through 50, it says, And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to him, said to them, why are you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the saying that he had spoken to them. So again, we were talking about this idea when they finally find Jesus, they are astonished at what is going on. The people that are drawn in around him, the dialogue that he's having with the religious leaders and I think it's worth mentioning that these are potentially the same religious leaders who are willing to have a dialogue with him to entertain the questions that he has as a young man, but would not be willing to entertain the questions and the dialogue that he would have with them as a grown man. These same people could be the same uh, people in the future who will be crying out to crucify him. So this is all interesting as we try to unpack the ministry of Jesus throughout his whole life as to what could be going on here and who he's interacting with. But his mother says, why are you doing this? You know, why have you caused us so much distress? And he answers her question back this way. Why were you looking for me? Did you not know I must be in my father's house? So from right here, around the age of 12, Jesus already understands what his purpose is, what his sense of calling and mission and obedience is to God. And that phrase, I must, follows Jesus in his words in the rest of Scripture. In Luke 4.43, he says, I must preach the kingdom of God. In Luke 9.22, he says, I must suffer many things. In Luke 19.5, Zacchaeus, I must go to your house today. And in Luke 24, 7, it says that the Son of Man 
must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. So from a very young age, Jesus understood he had a sense of calling that he must be living his life in such a way to fulfill God's will for him in his life. That's a lesson for us today, too. We also, being like Christ, are called to be obedient, to have this sense of urgency when it comes to following God's will for our individual lives. And we all have different gifts and talents and abilities. So I'm going to ask you another question. What is one way you need to prioritize the mission of God in your life? Take a minute and discuss that. All right, we're going to continue reading through God's word here. And in verses 51 and 52, we read, And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. Now, I think it's important to know here that as we read this passage, it may be easy to think that Jesus was doing something to dishonor his mother, mother and father. But I don't think that's the case. In fact, I think the author here, Luke, goes out of his way to make sure that we understand that Jesus was submissive to them. And that because of that, his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus continued to grow in wisdom and in stature and in favor with both God and man. Which I think is a great way for us to understand what we also are called to do as we are called to be Christ-like. We are to be uh, increasing in our wisdom, growing in our faith, in our knowledge of who God is, uh, always growing in our stature. Um, this is probably specifically talking about Jesus' physical nature, so to a certain point we probably stop doing that. Um, but then also in favor, not just with God, but with man as well. And as we understand the greatest commandment, as Jesus says it, is to love the Lord our God with everything we have, and then to also love our neighbor as ourself. So as Jesus, as we're looking at this passage, I think it kind of ends on this note of Jesus being submissive to his parents, but also growing, continuing to grow in his knowledge and wisdom, but also in his relationship with God and other people. So now uh, it's not about Jesus disobeying his parents or anything like that, but this is perhaps a, a wake-up call for them to understand who Jesus is and that his time is beginning as he is fully understanding that he is God fully and man fully. And so, you know, we, we know that they had both been visited by God in visions or by angels, and they've been told who Jesus is, how special he's going to be, and what he's going to do for God's people. But then some time has passed. They even moved to Egypt for a little bit because of the, uh, you know, Herod's decree to, to kill all the male children. But now some years have passed, and now they get to see this opportunity where Jesus is able to show them who he is and who God is making him to be. And so as we look at this last part, we see the submission of Jesus. I want to spend a moment talking about what does Scripture say about how we are to submit. And we see this primarily summed up in all of uh, Ephesians 5 and 6. And we see that um, the word submission in our culture today can sometimes be taken almost with a negative connotation, I feel like, in some cases where people don't want to submit. We want to be free. We don't want people telling us what to do and all those kinds of things. But the word submission 
in the language here has more to do with coming under someone's responsibility. It has to do with someone being over you for the sake of taking care of you, providing for you, and, and so much more. But here's what we see in Ephesians 5 and 6 is that we are to submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. That the church is to, is to submit to Christ. That husbands are to submit in their love to their wives as a self-sacrificial kind of love like Christ has for his church, which is all-out love for another. Uh, children, we're supposed to uh, submit to our parents. Employees, um, submit to their managers as if doing the work of God. And as nations, as a country, we are to submit to the governing authorities that God has appointed above us. So all of these things, none of them are negative in any way because I know um, for a lot of people it has to do with I don't want to have to answer to somebody, but it's not so much. If all of this is done according to God's word, it's not about having to do something. It's doing something out of reverence for God and for one another, just as Jesus was able to grow in favor with God and man. So here's my final thing, a, a, a challenge that I want to offer to all of you this week is, is to do this, to grow in our submission to God and others, to grow in wisdom and in favor with God, and to grow in our urgency to do the will of God as well. As a final challenge uh, this week, it's something that you can discuss with others or uh, whoever you're with at home. And the question is this, what are some things that you can do to focus more on God and to grow in your faith? And what are some of the things that distract or prevent you from doing so? So this week, as you uh, go on uh, with your quarantine, whatever that may look like, some of you may be able to work, but I imagine the majority of us are probably stuck at home and not able to go to work or do many things that aren't considered essential. So be working on those three things, and uh, as we close our time today, I'd love to pray for you. And if you have any prayer requests, please put them in the comment description below. I'd love to know how we as a staff can be praying for you and what your needs are. And if you just have something that you want to share that is a praise, a good story, something that happened that only God could have uh, made happen in your life this last week, please write that in the comments of this video, and we look forward to reading those. But until then, let me pray for you guys. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. Uh, God, we thank you that we have the technology uh, that we can use to still connect with one another and be able to uh, still connect with, with you through your word. And God, we, we are so thankful for that. There are so many countries in our world today that, number one, don't have the freedom and don't have the luxury of using the technology that we have available to us to be able to connect with you through worship and your word, but to also connect with one another. So God, we are, we are very thankful for the opportunity that we have, even though it's not optimal. We'd love to be together. We'd love to have fellowship and all those things. But God, we are thankful for even this, even though it looks different. And God, we, we thank you for um, just all the things that you allow us to know through your word. God, it would be so much more harder to understand who you are and what your desire is for our life if we didn't understand what your word has to say, if we didn't have your word at all. And so, God, we thank you for this lesson that we learned today as we look at this little glimpse into Jesus' life, and we pray that we would be able to live up to the calling that your word gives us, that we would grow in our wisdom, in our favor with you, that we would be able to uh, get along well in our relationships with others around us. And God, we just, again, we thank you for all the blessings that we continue to have, even in difficult times like this, that God, uh, we can sometimes quickly pray that these things and these times would be taken away from us, uh, but God, more than that, we just pray for strength and endurance to be able to do what we can to make the most out of the situation if it brings glory to you. So God, we, we love you, we thank you, and uh, we give you all praise. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. See you guys. Hope you have a good week.